Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Get prepared for the spaceship feedback. No, it's not this evening. Good deal. Awesome. All right, so we are going to uh, to spend our Sunday nights not necessarily having a, a sermon. But we're going to spend our Sunday nights going over our Bible study that we are going to engage in with people when we have a Bible study with them. And so uh, with that in mind, I'd just like to open up this with a word of prayer to kind of, I guess, close out our worship service in a, in a way and sort of enter into the Bible class format so people may feel more comfortable in uh, commenting and asking questions. And then at the conclusion, I'm going to make it clear and enter into an invitation. And uh, Ava will lead us in our invitation song. So it's kind of different, uh, abnormal, but that's okay. If you would, bow with me in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we're grateful to be here this evening. And we uh, are especially grateful for this opportunity we have to better equip ourselves to be personal workers for you. We're mindful of the souls and in this community, the souls that we wrote down today, the ones that are on our hearts, and I pray that we'll be intentional and, and have them in mind as we think and we strategize and we prepare to enter into Bible studies with them. Please be with all of us. Help us to be good students, uh, to learn what your will is for us and what your will is for everyone. We love you so much, and we're so grateful for you and your son. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Okay, so... You should have got a copy, I think I handed them out to everybody, of this quiz, the Back to the Bible Survey. And if you didn't get one, raise your hand. Okay? Could some, Mark, would you, uh, Deborah and Wayne and Evelyn? Uh, I have some, I'm sorry, they're on the back table. So this is page 111 in your Evangelism Simplified book this booklet. Um, and we are going to be using these a lot. If we get into Bible studies, this is going to kind of be the place where we begin our Bible studies. And so since we only have that one copy in the book, I cut mine out of the book and I made a bunch of copies. And so we're going to keep these quizzes stocked on that back table at all times. So uh, keep a few with you. This quiz is going to sort of determine where you come from in your Bible studies with someone. You look at these questions, they're very, very basic. Do you know God exists? Yes, no, unsure. Uh, do you know who the Holy Spirit is? Yes, no, unsure. Do you believe the Holy Spirit is God? Yes, no, unsure. The questions are very, very, very simple. These questions are designed to give you an understanding of where this person is coming from. This, these questions aren't designed to be something that you answer immediately. There's you, you, When you enter into a Bible study and you begin here, you want to make it as, as uh, warm as you possibly can. You make it clear, listen, there may be a right or wrong answer to these questions, but we're not going to be looking at them as right or wrong tonight. We're going to be looking at them as what do you believe. We're not going to address them. We're not going to we're not going to uh, point any flaws out. I'm not going to make fun of you when you say no and the answer is yes or say you're unsure when it should be obvious. We're not going to do that. These are just answers that I want so that I'm going to be better to understand where you are coming from. When Jesus talked to people, he knew where they were coming from. He had the advantage of reading people's hearts and understanding their background in a miraculous way. We don't have that. And so this is a good starting point. Um, it's going to determine what Bible study method you use. So tonight we're going to begin looking at the Back to the Bible Lesson 1. Um, you should have got these during that training. And if you don't have one tonight, that's fine. You don't necessarily need a copy in order to, to be involved in this study. Um, but it would be good. And so if you do want one, raise your hand, and I'm going to have Mark be the uh, 
the passer router, I guess. And you can take this and make notes as we go. So we're just going to be going through lesson one tonight. We probably won't get very far in it. Um, but back to this quiz. Most of us, when we talk to someone in this area, are going to get a number of yes answers that, uh, that I think it's fair to assume you know, the majority of people are going to say, yes, they know God exists. Most people around here believe in God. Uh, yes, they at least believe they know who the Holy Spirit is. Uh, yes, most people are going to believe that the Holy Spirit is God. Do you know who Jesus is? Yes, most people are going to know who Jesus is. And if those are all yeses, or even if, even if some of those are no, but if they have, yes, I know God exists, and yes, I know Jesus is the Son of God, you want to begin with the back to the Bible. You have some common ground with this individual. We, we don't need to build the foundation that God exists. So that's a good thing. If they say no to these things, uh, there is another Bible study method that's called uh, back to the Bible. It's that white uh, set. And it's all based and starts with Christian evidences. And we'll end up going through that eventually. We're beginning here because this is where the majority of our people are going to find themselves. All right, so we have this quiz. It's, it's set up to help us uh, to know where this person is coming from. The benefit of this quiz is also that you're going to be able to refer back to this. As you go through this study, it, it's, it's very, very simple. But there are certain points that address specific questions, and you might refer back. Hey, remember, remember on that quiz, you said that uh, you said that you were saved. About the eighth question now, you said you were saved, and then you said when you were saved, uh, you were saved when you believed. <clears throat> now we've studied what the Bible says. And how do you feel about that question? You might refer back to that question. You might not drill them. You might not hammer them and say, I told you. But you go back to it. And you say, what do you think about this? And they might say, oh, I don't know. And you keep going on that study. And they say, I still think I'm saved. You, like, like Rob said, table that. Table it and keep going. It's not like we're going to convert them with one verse. But that's the benefit of this quiz. You can always refer back to where the person is coming from. I'll tell you a, a psychological benefit to the quiz, because whenever I've entered into a Bible study, I pull out this quiz. I can attest to its effectiveness. And one thing that uh, is kind of hard to explain until you get into the situation is when you pull out this quiz, it gets serious. And the people that you're studying with, you may be having you know, just a jovial good time with them, when you say, hey, you want to have a Bible study? They say, oh, yeah, yeah, let's have a Bible study. You get your Bibles out, and they think it's going to be a discussion. You know, I'm going to read a verse, and we're going to tell each other how we feel about that verse. A lot of people think that. But when you sit down with somebody, and you say, let's have a Bible study, and you pull out this quiz, something changes. And it becomes, it becomes real. It becomes a, a situation where they know, okay, there is, a, there is an authority in this Bible study. There is somebody who is controlling this. Uh, and that's a good thing. Because we don't want to enter into Bible studies where we are just going into, tell me what you think this verse means or how does this verse make you feel. Those are good. Those are nice. There's nothing wrong with having those discussions. But we're trying to figure out how to save souls. And this is an entirely different format. We're the ones who are required to make disciples. Um, disciples are always going to be taught. They're always going to be learned people. And in order for someone to learn, there has to be a teacher. That's who we are. And so this survey sort of just, without even <coughs> saying, I'm in charge of this study. This survey just kind of says it for you. And it's, it's a nice thing because that is a difficult that is a difficult bridge to gap. I love this survey for that reason more than anything else. It just immediately sets the tone of we're getting into a Bible study and this is going to be serious.
uh, from this point on. All right, so does everyone understand the sermon? Question and answer. Rob said that he fills this out for people. Whenever I've done these, I've always sat down uh, with the person and I've had my own survey. I print mine off, I take the survey with them. I say, okay, do you know God exists? I circle yes, just to make them feel comfortable. You know, um, but whatever you choose to do doesn't doesn't really matter. Um, that's the way I do it. You're going to want to have these surveys every time you do a Bible study, if if possible. Always have a copy of, of these in your Evangelism Simplified book. It basically fits perfectly in there. It might hang over a little bit. Always have a copy of uh, that quiz. Does anybody have any comments about? The quiz or the survey. Any, any thoughts about that? Does it make sense? Go there. Are you offended? I thought you were two questions and didn't explain the same on the survey. Sure, sure. Sure. That, that absolutely better come up in that Bible study. Absolutely. And they understand what that means. Yeah, yeah, sure thing. Absolutely. Um, all right, so we are going to begin looking at this uh, first green Bible study. And um, if you open up to, I guess it's page number two. If you look at the very, very top, it says our authority in religion. And these are some things that we're going to talk about, but you don't necessarily need to go over this with all your students, but it's good for us to understand what we're dealing with here. What we're trying to deal with with the student is establishing authority. Uh, we need to be people of authority. And what we say doesn't matter. That's what we're trying to convey. It doesn't matter how I feel. It doesn't matter how you feel. There has to be an authority. That's what this whole section is dealing with. Where is our authority? Um, and so I, I just wanted to think about authority for a little bit and appreciate the fact that God is a God of authority. And I have a number of passages that you might want to jot down Use them if you want to when you're when you're talking to somebody and you're trying to establish this first point. But God is the creator of authority. He is the ultimate authority. Uh, in Genesis chapter 1, verse number 1, we have the immediate example of God's authority. God created the heavens and the earth. The creator always has the authority over the creation. That's just a matter of fact. Even so much so that when a musician gets a record label, sometimes they, sell, they, they sign a bad deal and the producer gets all the creative rights and they get none of the royalties whatsoever. We feel sorry for that because we believe that the creator deserves the benefit. They have the authority to determine what happens to their music or whatever they've created. Well, that's a true principle. God is the creator, and the creator always has the authority. So you might want to write down Genesis 1-1 and Isaiah chapter four, uh, 45, verses 9 through 12. Woe to him who strives with him who formed him, a pot among earthen pots. Does the clay say to him who forms it, what are you making? Or your work has no handles. Woe to him who says to the father, what are you begetting? Or to a woman with what are you in labor? Thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, and the one who formed him. Ask me of things to come. Uh, will you command me concerning my children and the work of my hands? I made the earth and created man on it. It was my hands that stretched out the heavens, and I commanded all their hosts. Now, the very fact that God created makes God the ultimate authority. God is a God of authority. And the, 
creation, God establishes the authority of his word. In Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, God gives the command to Adam that he can have access to anything in that garden except for the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And we learn the authority of God's word by the simple fact that when Adam broke that command, God stuck to what he had authorized. He said, you will surely die. Has anybody seen Adam lately? God's word is authority. And God is a God of authority. Um, God establishes an authority structure in the home. In Genesis chapter 2, verse number 24, Adam says, This is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now the Bible speaks of the value of men and women, but there is an authority structure that God has set up in the family. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, verse number 8, it says, Man was not made from woman, but woman for man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. That is why a, a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. The point we want to make from that is God is a God of authority. He's a God of authority in the fact that he authorizes, but he has set up different hierarchies of authority in the natural world. The family, the patriarchy, is an authority structure that God has set up. He respects authority. Um, he sets up the authority for children. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 1, it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first command with promise, that it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land. Man, mom and dad are an authority. Now, why did God set up that authority? Because God is a God of authority. He's established all these different authorities. The authority from a child to its parent. The authority of the husband and the wife. Why did he set those up? Because he is a God of authority, and authority and respect for authority should come natural to us. From the time we're little kids, we should have respect for our mom and dad. When, the, when we get married, we should have a respect for the home. And then when it comes time to be shown God, well, authority makes sense. I understand authority. I've been taught authority my whole life. I may not have known it, but all of these little structures and hierarchies are there to point to God's authority. Uh, another example would be the authority of government. God respects the authority of government. In Genesis chapter 12, verse number 2, God promises Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation. And when we parallel that with Daniel chapter 2, verse 21, and Daniel chapter 4, and verse number 17, we realize that God works, and he establishes and tears down kingdoms of men. Those are authorities that God has set up or God has destroyed. And in Romans chapter 13 and verse number 1, we are told to respect those authorities. Now why is that? Because God is a God of authority. All of these different hierarchies that we see, they're, they're not really of any purpose other than for us to just be handed off right to God and understand that God has authority. Um, well, I shouldn't say they don't have any other purpose. The ultimate purpose is for us to be handed off to God, that God has all the authority. And so you might find that useful, you might not, but that's what we're talking about. We're trying to talk and, and show people that God has the authority, all right? Any comments on that or, or verses you might want to add or anything? Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to go through this Study line by line, verse by verse. And what I want you to do, I know this will not be uh, comfortable in a setting like this, but it will be beneficial for the class is if you have a question, ask it. Because if you have a question, somebody else probably has that same question. So 
If you don't understand the point we're making, or if you have a, a rebuttal, an argument that you think someone might throw out there, give it to us. And, uh, and we can prepare ourselves for that. This is the setting where we, we, it's a safe space. This is our safe space to be able to ask the questions, to be able to learn uh, how to be, be better Bible teachers, okay? So don't be embarrassed if you don't know something and you need to ask a question. There's nothing to be ashamed of there. All right, John chapter 8, verse number 32. <laughs> So when you're in the study itself, all you have to do, all you have to do is get this booklet out, get a Bible for yourself and the person you're studying with. If you only have one Bible, sit there with them, let them turn the pages, and let them use the Bible. These verses are going to become so familiar to us, we don't really need the Bible other than to make them feel comfortable. All right, so John 8, 32. Jesus says, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. When you have that person read that, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to go back to the first question. I mean, this Bible study is this simple. It says, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. The blank. Jesus says, the blank will make you free. <laughs> What's the blank? Everybody. The truth. The truth will make you free. Now, there may be some questions. There may be a question of free from what? Well, you may want to make this little quick mark. You may want to underline the word free in that verse and just look down at verse number 34. Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. What are we set free from? We're set free from our sins. Now, you don't need to point that out, but that's an appropriate answer. That's Someone asks, what, what am I set free from? You say, oh, look, right here in the same context, you are a slave to sin. And the truth is going to set you free from that uh, enslavement. There's a, another point that, that may be appropriate to know and point out. You may want to underline the phrase, you shall know. This verse teaches us that we can know the truth. That's a very, very important point to make. Now, we don't want to get into an argument at this point. We don't want to... Uh, to end the Bible study on this first point. But there are some verses that we can, we can also write down that go along with uh, this idea. You shall know the truth. Write down Ephesians chapter 3 and verse number 4 and, and link it to that phrase. Ephesians 3 and verse number 4. Paul says, and when you read my words, or when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. We can know the truth, and truth comes by reading. And that's the way that we, we come to know the truth. You can know the truth. If, if it was impossible to know the truth, then salvation is impossible. We need to understand that point. Um, again, these are, these are supplementary for uh, the study itself, just to make sure that you are an expert of this verse. You shall know the truth. Uh, know everything that you can about what this verse means. This verse means I can know the truth. This verse means the truth is what's going to set me free. I'm going to be set free from my sins because of the truth. We need to understand when we have them read that verse that that's what we want them to know. What we don't want to do is what we don't we don't want people to read a verse and we don't we don't know anything that it's talking about. We don't want to appear like we're ripping a verse out of its context. The worst things we could do is rip a verse out of its context and say 
this verse is telling you to do this, and that verse is not applicable to that person at all. That's one of the greatest problems in the world today. People rip verses out of their context. And so what we are doing right now is we're looking at these contexts and realizing that the verse and the question on our quiz says exactly what, what the author intended for it to say. Jesus says the truth will make you free. That's completely true based on this verse. All right. So we're establishing the authority in religion. So for our own expertise, what's the authority then for being set free from our sins? The word. The word. That's right. Okay. So we got that. The word is the authority for being set free from our sins. Now go to John chapter 4 and verse number 24. Before we go there, you know, there's a condition for being able to know the truth. The condition is there in verse 29. Right. We have to abide in his word to know the truth. Right. Or to go on to condemnation and confusion. Right. Yes, absolutely. Um. Yeah, and, and the Bible study is all going to those same places, you know. Uh, that's the conclusion we're going to get to, and you're exactly right. There's a, there's a verse you might want to write next to uh, John 8, verse 31, and that's John 5, verse 24. Jesus says this, it's, it's very closely uh, worded language, but he says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my words... And believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. And so we learn the way that we uh, receive that word. It comes by hearing. Does that ring a bell of another verse? Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Again, we don't want to necessarily go down any of these roads at this point. This is for our expertise. This is so that we know what we're talking about and we're not just ripping verses out of their context. Um, and uh, we don't necessarily want to go down any of these rabbit holes because this Bible study is set up to go down them for us. There's two verses, though, that you could, you could jot down that, that would be a good reference to. And that's uh, John 17, 17. Um, are, you, are you familiar with that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that is... Uh, the next verse I was going to say to write down in that okay, in that passage. Right, right. Um, they're both the word spirit. That word, if you continue in my word, then you will know the truth. Mm -hmm. Not the truth in the word. Sanctify them in thy truth. The word is truth. Right. Not the truth in the word. The word is truth. Study and give diligence to see that stuff that's really there is not the man that do this not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Implies that you can. Implies that you can rightly divide it. Uh, you're, you're exactly right. You want to write John 17, 17 next to John 8, 32. Now, if you look back at your Bible study uh, booklet, John 17, 17 is, uh, well, we have one more verse to look at, and then John 17, 17 is going to tie some ideas together. So at John 8.32, write John 17.17. 17. That verse says, sanctify them in your truth, thy word is truth. Now, let's turn to John chapter 4 and verse number 24.
John 4, 24, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Now, again, this, we can get into a number of different discussions. Uh, worship is addressed in these Bible studies. And so the, the correct manner of worship is going to be gone over before anyone is brought to the waters of baptism. And so we don't need to get into those weeds. We're trying to establish the authority for worship. That's what we're trying to do. So go back to John 8.32. Don't turn back to John 8.32, but on your booklet, make it clear. The first principle that we're trying to establish is that the word or the, the, uh, the truth is what sets us free from our sins. And the truth is necessary to have acceptable worship. Make those two distinctions clear. Those are the two points that we want the student to get from here. The Word of God is what's going to teach us what we need to do to be saved. And the Word of God is going to teach us how to worship Him in an acceptable way. And once you've made those things clear, look back up at our title. Our authority in religion. In those two verses, we have looked at all aspects uh, of religion. How to be set free from our sins, what we need to obey, how we need to live our lives, and, uh, and then how to worship God. That, that's, that's religion. We've established that the word, the truth, is our authority uh, in religion. Now, let's flip over to John 17, 17. Does anybody have a, a comment about uh, worshiping in spirit and in truth? Uh, again, I don't want to get into a deep study on worship right now because it's going to be covered. So, is that acceptable? All right, John 17, 17. Oh, I forgot I had this on the screen. I'm sorry. Okay. I meant to have that for anybody that didn't have the uh, little book in front of them. John, yeah. something I would uh, I would just try and table because as you keep going page number three it gets into the Holy Spirit's role in uh, revealing the truth and so when we get into that we'll probably deep dive a little bit more into some of those concerns but at this point in time still know what you have coming you, you have teaching on that um, and if that doesn't satisfy them when you get to it then be ready to address it more. But you're exactly right. That is that is something you can't expect, and so that's a good point. It's a good point. Someone is going to probably say, yeah, I worship in spirit, and I'm true to my heart. That's the way they're going to interpret that. And so you say, oh, okay. Well, let's go to John 17, 17, all right? And hopefully this verse will uh, speak to that person. John 17, 17. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. All right. So we have a definition then of the truth that sets us free in John 8, 32. And we have a definition of the truth that lends itself to acceptable worship in John chapter 4. In verse number 24. What is the truth? Thy word. Whose word? God's word. Um, and in this verse again, it's, it's telling us the same thing that John 8.32 said. Sanctify them by thy truth. Cleanse them 
Make them holy by thy truth. Set them free from their sins by thy truth. You might want to circle sanctify and write cleanse or make holy. And then write in the margin of your Bible, let me, uh, let me double check this reference real quick. Uh, you might want to write in the margin of John 17, 17, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 4. 1 Timothy 2, verse number 4. Who desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Our salvation and the truth have to be uh, interlinked with one another. Uh, along with that, uh, we want to write down John 14, 23, and 24 on John 17, 17. Because Jesus here is praying to the Father. He's saying, Father, your word is true. So what we're doing is we're trying to map out uh, our authority in religion. And how do we get from the Father's word being true to these 27 books of the New Testament? That's what we're really trying to get to. So we're starting out now, thy word, the Father, God the Father's word is true. <laughs> And that's what we've concluded in these three verses. God is the ultimate authority in religion. There shouldn't be any argument from anyone once this principle is established. Everyone should agree God is the authority in religion. Uh, everyone should agree that God's word is the authority in religion. You might take the time, for instance, if, like Daryl said, this person says, well, the spirit guides me. Well, don't say that the spirit and whatever they're saying the spirit is um, <coughs> is right or whatever this is leading them to do is the right thing to do but at least confirm with this person at this point that the word of God is the truth they may think they have the word of God being spoken to them at least get them to admit yes the word of God is the authority and if this is not the word of God then I'm not authorized to do it. Because this is the point we're trying to establish. God's word is authority. <coughs> and we're going to get to the New Testament being the way that that will and authority is revealed to us. But at this point, that's, that's the point we want to get nailed down this morning. God's word is the authority. So what I've done on my booklet, just for my own help, is I have this bracketed off. The first three verses, John 8, 32, John 4, 24, and John 17, 17, I just have it bracketed off. God is the authority in all matters of religion. And I know that at this point, I want to I stop and I just want to probe a little bit and make sure that we're on the same page. Do you agree? Do you agree that God's word is the, is the authority uh, in all matters of religion? And if they say yes, that's great. Keep on going with it. Um, if they say no at that, go back to those verses and ask questions. What does that verse say? What does this verse say? What does this verse say? And read it over and over and over until they can read it. Sometimes we read things we don't. This happens to me. I can read something five times and I don't see it. And the sixth time I read it, I see it. And uh, especially somebody who for their entire life doesn't see things, they got blinders on, they got a veil covering them, and they may need to read it 10 times. Uh, but I would encourage you to really pause and make sure that you have that established foundation. God's word is the authority. We haven't, we haven't defined what God's word is yet. All right? We don't need to get lost in those weeds. Just that God's word is authority. Does that make sense? Any, any thoughts about that? Good. <laughs> okay. All right. So now, let's see if we have this. 
All right, page 66 in your evangelism workbook. You want to turn over there. Now we're going to end just by pointing this out. We'll come back and uh, deal with the, the rest of this first section next week. But we are talking about the map of Revelation. All right, so we're starting with the foundational piece up here at the top, that God the Father is the one responsible for all truth. And by the time we are done with this study, we are going to arrive at the conclusion that the New Testament is that authority. So we're going to, by the time we're done with this study, the person we're studying with hopefully is going to agree. The Word of God, the Bible, is where we find out what God wants us to do to be saved and how to worship him in an acceptable way. All right, so for myself, I'm not going to put this out at the beginning with the person and say, this is what we're going to study. I'm going to go through this entire study with the person, and then I'm going to pull this out and allow it to cause their brain to click. Now, that's, that's the way I do it. I'm not saying if you pull this out at the beginning, and you say, I want, to sh I want to prove this to you. I don't think that's wrong. But the way my mind works, if someone tells me something and then they give me an illustration at the very end, it's just going to tie it all together for me. And so that's the way that I do it. But this study, you might want to write on this page, Our Authority in Religion. You might want to write uh, page 66 right up there in, in your corner, uh, right-hand corner or left-hand corner, whatever corner you want to write about. So write that number on. Um, I am? Yeah, man. Well, first of all, uh, the top corner of this Bible is uh, the Old and Holy Ring. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I never run into one, but. Yeah, we're going to run into all <laughs> sorts of people. We are. We are. And again, there's people out there that think there has to be a gift in the body to say God. You know, we know a lot of people in different groups that have additional gifts that they go by for supplements. Yeah. Yep. And uh, it's really difficult to get people that are really uh, learned in their particular religion. It's, it's hard to get them to focus down on the fundamentals of faith because they've been indoctrinated too much with, with whatever the tradition that they are brought. So, sure. You're, you're exactly right. And um, that, I would say that's another benefit of doing that quiz. You know, um, and I, I also think that. We need to keep in mind sort of the situation that we're going to be in this Bible study. Um, we're not probably going to get into a Bible study at the doorstep of somebody in this sort of format. These <coughs> Bible studies are not, they're not throwaway deals. These Bible studies are intended to be used on somebody who you've already built this sort of trust and they're interested in something that you have to say based on what we've been doing with uh, our compassion cards or just how you've affected their life just being their friend or family member or something and this is one of those situations where you're sitting down with, with this person and you're already intimate with them there, there's already this, this degree of trust um, and then once you sit down and you pull out this this quiz and everything gets serious, um, I, I believe that you're never going to really run into a huge problem. When you, when you get to that point where you're actually sitting down to study the Bible with somebody and there is just this cordial relationship that you have, it's, it's not going to be argumentative. Uh, there's going to be questions. And there may be difficulties when you get to a sin or something that's very, very uh, precious to them as far as how they worship. But at least the format that we're talking about, we're not, I don't think we're going to be finding ourselves in those situations too much. Um, but as we door knock and have those conversations and, and try and build relationships, that's certainly going to be the case. Um, yeah, go ahead. What we need to do is kind of uh, this one I say I did not go through this too early. 
Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's one thing that I'm glad you said that. Um, <laughs> these are not uh, a door knocking tool, or these are not a, a, a track. I think the set of these is like $3 for all three of them. So they cost money. Uh, and there's never going to be a situation where somebody says, don't take those and discourage you. But understand, sort of, this is for. Bible studies that you are really agreed upon, you're going to enter into a true Bible study. Don't go out and hand these out to somebody and say, hey, do this and bring it back to me. We have we have uh, Bible correspondence courses in the back that are made for that. They're very cheap. They're very good. That's a good thing to carry around with you if you <coughs> want to do that. But these are, these are not that. These are sit-down Bible studies. I'm going to take the time with you and I, I would say, you know, if you're not willing to take the time, don't take these. If you're not in your mind willing to say, I'm going to, I'm willing to give up three or four hours of my life to study with somebody for this. Don't even, don't even take them because that is at least what it's going to take. Um, again, not to discourage anybody from taking them. Take them, but intend to use them. Um, and that goes, that goes for a lot of the material back. You know, the, the stuff that we have on the table in the back, there are some things like this where it's like they're on the table, there's a big stack of them. We're not going to be monitoring who's taking what, but um, some of the other materials, um, you're, you're free to have them, but they're going to be more on a request. We have, and just basically the rule of thumb back there is this. If there's one or two of an item, just ask, and, and we'll get one from uh, a different supply. We'll leave those on the table. If there's a big stack of them, just you don't need to ask anything. Just take them as you see fit. I think that's a, a decent rule of thumb. You think, Mark? Yeah, uh, again, I would encourage if you're not going to get printed material, mm -hmm. material that is done, material that is ready, or if you do like I did when I first, I did not. <laughs> You're right. Um, one thing I will say, um, you don't have to wait till we're done going through this training. Please don't wait. If you have somebody that you will sit down and have a Bible study with, now we're going to make you an expert on all this stuff, but I'm telling you, as somebody who has used this, these verses are not being ripped out of their context. They're teaching the truth. And if you just sit down and just say, all you need to do is say, look, I just want to study the Bible with you. Read this verse. And you don't, you don't know how to defend anything. But let me tell you, it's not your problem. Because they're reading the Word of God. And if they have an argument against the Word of God, ultimately, that's between them and God. That's not between them and you. So we're going to be better. We're going to be better prepared for every single answer. But... Be confident that even if you're not really comfortable, this is this is the truth. And all they're doing is reading the word of God and answering a fill in the blank question or true or false. Um, and, and be uh, confident in that. Um, you may think that this is going to take us forever. It's not. We had a lot of introductory material tonight. We'll move a lot faster the next few weeks. Go ahead, Daryl.
Scheduled, I believe it's going to be in October. Hopefully, we can do something sooner than that. When we get into door knocking, we'll lean heavily on your experiences for sure. Avery was telling me his neighbor, uh, he, he was talking about the church. He said, Some guy that came by and old guy came with him. Already told us about him. <laughs> so, you're known, Darrell, and we appreciate everything you do. <laughs> All right, we're gonna uh, we're gonna close out there tonight. We'll go back to Matthew twenty-eight, verse number eighteen. In that great commission, Jesus says, "All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father." the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That word disciple means learned ones. The, the gospel is a learned system of religion. You don't just magically become a Christian. You have to be taught how to become a Christian. That's exactly what Jesus is saying in the Great Commission. Since Pentecost and Acts chapter 2, this has been the format of how someone becomes a Christian. From then to right now, nothing's changed. It comes by hearing. You have to be taught the word of God. Romans chapter 10, verse number 17. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. We need to believe. Without faith, it is impossible to be pleasing unto God. Hebrews 11 Verse number six, we need to repent of our sins. Uh, Luke chapter 13 and verse three says that unless we repent, we will all likewise perish. We need to confess Christ, Romans chapter 10 and verse number 10. We need to be baptized. That phrase, baptizing them, is a participle which tells you how you become a disciple. You can hear the gospel, you can believe the gospel, you can repent of your sins, you can confess, but you're not made a disciple until you finally are baptized into Christ. It's God's plan of salvation. It hasn't changed. Started in Acts chapter 2, continues to today. Stephen, have you accepted those terms? Have you obeyed that gospel plan? We're also commanded to live faithfully to the end. And if you've not been faithful, just because you accepted these terms at one time doesn't mean that you can let go of the rope, the hope of salvation, and go back into the world. There may be someone who needs to respond to the invitation tonight, to become a Christian, or to rededicate their life to Christ. If there's any need, please come forward.